Chapter 9 of The Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lightning and Thunder. I took shelter from a thunderstorm in a prospector's cabin far up a mountain slope. Jerry Sullivan and I stood in the open door, watching the breaking clouds over us and the drifting clouds in the canyons below when out of an almost clear sky came a bolt of lightning it struck an aged fir tree within sixty feet of the cabin and blew it as completely to fragments as though dynamited from top to bottom splinters and chunks of wood were showered around us a shattered stump two feet in diameter and not more than a foot high was all that remained of the eighty-foot fir booming and broken echoes of the crash resounded among the canyons to camouflage my feelings i turned to sullivan and in a matter-of-fact manner asked why is it that lightning never strikes twice in the same place like lightning came the reply it don't need to but lightning does strike twice and even repeatedly in the same place within one mile of my mountain home was a western yellow pine that during thirty years was struck fourteen times it was wrapped three times in a single season and twice during one storm and it is likely that it was hit a number of times during its earlier years a scar nearly a century old just above the roots of the tree showed that one lightning stroke had burst out a chunk of wood several feet long none of these strokes did serious damage many trees appear to be good conductors and rarely is one killed this pine when finally killed by beetles was probably more than three hundred years old another pine less than twenty-five feet from this one and nearly as large was struck three times while its neighbor received fourteen strokes i have dissected trees in various parts of the country and occasionally found one which bore unmistakable evidences of having been struck a number of times john muir told me that the head of a sequoia tree is sometimes struck repeatedly he had seen living trees struck and had examined the lightning scarred tops of fallen dead ones it is a common belief that lightning does not strike twice in the same place but a colored man was convicted by appearances that tree has been struck three times by lightning boss said sam impossible sam lightning never strikes twice in the same place you know well say boss the thing that struck it yesterday bears a striking resemblance to what struck it before on scores of occasions during my years of camping over north america lightning appeared to see how close to me it could strike without hitting me i once held the common and preconceived notion that there were some species of trees that lightning was pretty certain to strike and other species which it never struck but lightning more than any other natural agency that i know has a speedy and one hundred percent efficient way of eradicating superstitions concerning itself the only thing certain about lightning is that there is nothing certain about it it cannot be anticipated it never encourages one to predict where it will strike next its strategy is of a spectacular order and its attacks are ever a successful surprise lightning strikes every known species of tree it not only strikes trees that stand on summits but it comes down to those that lead lowly lives in canyons there are conditions however which cause a tree to be frequently struck a tall tree of any species is more likely to be wrapped on the head than its contemporary of conventional height a tree on a hilltop being closer to the electrical field is more likely to be struck than the tree in a ravine a lone tree much more likely than one in a grove in fact 
the tree in a position to intercept most electrical discharges and to offer these discharges the best local conductor into the earth is the one most likely to be struck in this connection it is said that trees rich in starch are much more frequently struck than those rich in rosin that is an elm or poplar is more likely to be hit than a pine or a spruce but often it appears to be the tree with good current transmission that is struck trees deeply rooted are more frequently struck than shallow rooted ones if a tree is shallow rooted or is rooted among dry rocks it is something of an insulator or poor conductor there is little likelihood of its being used by a lightning bolt in reaching the earth a green tree rooted in a moist place or among mineralized rocks is an excellent conductor and offers shelter of first rank for those of the suicide club the old pine struck fourteen times was rooted in an outcrop of iron core and a number of its roots penetrated the moist soil to a nearby brook years ago while making a nature address i was asked the question does lightning ever strike a mulberry tree i did not know and answered another question which was asked at the same instant ignored the mulberry tree and went on talking at the next pause however the lady repeated her question in these words if i take refuge beneath a mulberry tree during a thunderstorm will i be safe being young wise and impertinent i could not miss the opportunity to say madam it all depends upon the kind of life you're leading many believe that it is most dangerous to take refuge beneath a tree during a storm especially under a conspicuously placed tree but as a matter of fact the majority of people struck by lightning are struck in the open fields but this risk is absurdly small other risks not lightning seriously concern life insurance companies there is an old proverb which is supposed to contain wisdom for those outdoors during a storm it says avoid the oak flee from the spruce seek the beach this advice is obsolete the beech receives proportionately as many wraps as any other species in the nature of things it should be the best conductor of the three species named the incomplete european records concerning lightning show that members of the poplar family aspen and cottonwood are the species more frequently struck in that part of the world it is quite probable that an investigation would show that these trees stand in the most inviting places or in soil that renders them an easy or even alluring conductor for lightning in its zigzag journeys from sky into earth the most frequently struck species of trees in any locality is probably the species most numerous or in the most exposed places or a combination of local conditions make it the superior conductor in western africa is a species more frequently struck than all the other local trees this the natives speak of as being hated by lightning in contrast to this expression is one which i have heard the cowboys use in certain small zones of arizona and new mexico the lightning strikes with remarkable frequency and the prevailing species struck is loved by lightning so far as i have noticed the particular species of tree most likely to be badly smashed or blown to pieces by lightning is the fir i cannot account for this unless it be due to a peculiar combination much moisture which is a good conductor for lightning and much pitch and rosin which are supposed to be almost non-conductors at any rate i have seen numbers of fir trees from forty to one hundred feet high that were cut down to the roots by a single stroke over an extensive area on mount meeker colorado 
balsam fir is the species which shows the most lightning wounds with limber pine second in number yet the dominant species in this zone which lies between the altitudes of nine thousand and eleven thousand feet is the engelmann spruce the spruce is several times as numerous as the other two species combined and in most areas is the taller it is possible that it is struck with equal frequency but rarely receives wounds that record the experience in the fir a slit or burst rent through the bark down one side of the tree was the lightning's mark this is the common lightning sign i have always considered storms especially good exhibitions and during camping trips often sought a commanding place to watch one from the rim of a canyon the top of a towering cliff and wind-swept treetops i have watched rain hurrying clouds and illuminating lightning these spectacular displays with the rumbling roar aroused and repeated by the mountains were among the most stirring contributions to my outings each experience was an adventure and never was a storm in any way dull sometimes lightning is a high explosive one of the many surprises which it gave me happened near my camp in arizona the bolt struck and wrecked the roots of the tree like a high explosive shell but blowing the trunk and top uninjured into the air lightning another time struck the side of a tree like a projectile and tore out a chunk of wood then completely wrecked a tree several yards beyond a lodgepole pine about sixty feet high and without a limb for forty feet was struck about twelve feet above the earth and cut off as though by a shell neither the stump below nor the trunk or top showed any trace of the bolt another time lightning struck the top of a tree and ran down the trunk into the earth where it apparently came in contact with the roots of another tree standing several yards off both trees were blown into the air together with the rocks in which their roots were entangled twice i have known bolts to wreck entire clumps of trees one of these contained nine and the other five trees another bolt near my camp in southern colorado blew all the leaves off a cottonwood clump without any other visible injury neither the wood in lightning struck trees nor the chunks of exploded ones as a rule show signs of heat or fire injury limbs of a lightning struck oak in southern colorado however were shattered and frayed out so that they appeared more like shredded hemp than anything else on examining a tree that i saw struck there were two parallel lines of rapture grooves about four inches apart down the trunk either the bolt had divided before striking the tree or else two bolts had struck the tree at about the same spot an instant apparently a bolt striking a treetop follows down the grain of the wood follows even the intensive twists of a tree from the top where it strikes to the earth in some trees this twist of grain was so spiral that the bolt passed three times around the tree trunk in its descent to the earth usually the bolt plows a tiny u-shaped groove through the bark without otherwise injuring the tree the lightning struck tree unless shattered to pieces usually survives but the openings which the lightning makes through the bark allow the entrance of insect enemies which frequently are detrimental there is not a complete agreement as to just what produces this wrecking explosiveness of lightning strokes it is generally believed that the explosion is due to the superheated steam in the tree trunk but in most cases the injuries are slight and the tree lives on i doubt if more than one percent of the lightning struck trees are set on fire of course it is the dead tree that is most inflammable 
but many times lightning fires the trash accumulated against the base of a green one lightning struck a green spruce on a slope visible from my camp in a few minutes a column of smoke enveloped the tree then rain poured down half an hour later i found that a square yard of trash and spruce needles at the foot of the tree had been fired before the rain drowned the fire one evening in the mesa verde national park lightning struck a dead pine on a canyon rim opposite where i was camping there was no sign of fire at the time a steady rainfall continued for three or four hours after the stroke but about midnight the treetop burned off and fell with a crash i leaped up to see sparks and chunks of fire bounding down the side of the canyon while the tall snag held up a flaming torch may it not be that lightning by starting a woods fire brought fire to our primitive ancestors if not to all tribes at least to many of them the ancients are said to have had many excellent legends concerning lightning one of the most appealing and poetic that i have heard says that originally all the river channels of the earth were plowed by lightning lightning is a common accompaniment of summer rains and repeated lightning strokes may be the chief feature of a summer storm then again there may be a rain without lightning or thunder being seen or heard lightning is occasionally noticed during early spring and late autumn and on rare occasions it makes startling appearances during winter storms lightning seems to strike more frequently in the plains and valleys than in the mountains during three hundred and five climbs to the top of long's peak i knew of lightning striking the summits but twice both bolts struck in precisely the same spot and in both cases the storm clouds were high above the summit most rainstorms in high mountains are on the slopes while the peaks and high plateaus tower above in the sunshine sometimes the summit points are in the midst of the storm but being in and not beneath the storm they are therefore less frequently struck than the slopes or the lowlands there may be exceptions in peaks of moderate height or those highly mineralized but when storms cover the mountains the summits of peaks rarely are below in the range of thunderbolts peaks in the upper edge of the storm cloud are frequently enveloped in what may be called an invisible zone of electricity this may zizz, zizz, and crackle around rock points and give a tingle to the hair and fingertips. But there is no striking in this zone. Here the fluid may concentrate and descend upon lesser heights. Though these so-called electrical storms are common on mountain peaks, I have not heard of their being fatal or even serious. But as Muir says, they often cause every hair on one's head to stand up like an enthusiastic congregation and sing. Lightning, however, is said to assail frequently the summit of Little Mount Ararat, Asia, and numbers of rocks on the top are shattered, bored through, and in places fused to glass by lightning strokes. Lightning sometimes strikes a gravelly or sandy place, and may penetrate for twenty feet or more leaving a tiny ragged edged hole an inch or less in diameter around the edge of this the sand and stone are fused into glass or near glass sometimes a bolt penetrates solid rock and makes a glassy hole but more often when rock is struck the bolt seems to explode as though resisted it was benjamin franklin who first thought to turn electrical energy into constructive work and also it was he who brought forward the lightning rod plan as a means of protecting buildings from lightning damage in may 1904 i happened to be on specimen mountain about thirteen thousand feet above the sea during the gathering and the continuance of a storm 
which deluged and greatly damaged the lowlands of northern colorado there were frequent lightning strokes the air was surcharged with juice this twitched and contracted my muscles and pulled my hair with an accompaniment of snapping crackling buzzing and humming the following day while the storm was at its wildest in the lowlands i was descending the mountains between eleven and nine thousand feet much of the time i was in the broken storm cloud and as i wrote in my notebook for two hours the crash and roll of thunder was incessant i counted twenty-three times that the lightning struck rocks but i did not see it strike a tree those who have not been in a violent thunderstorm in rugged high mountains perhaps cannot appreciate the remark of an old mountain guide who said the best thunders are always saved for the mountains the mountain walls cliffs and long receding slopes break repeat prolong and compound the thunders into a deep-toned orchestra i have heard of people having their shoes burst off by a lightning bolt without their receiving serious injury in cripple creek i saw a man at a windlass in an open space slightly injured by a lightning bolt which burst shoe soles and uppers completely apart and tore off most of his clothing a dry dead tree or limb is an extremely poor conductor but during a rain when covered with a film of water these are converted into excellent conductors apparently a lightning bolt will not leave a good conductor for a poor one while working in a tunnel extending nearly a thousand feet into a mountainside lightning struck the water pipe outside and followed this into the tunnel giving me a shake-up all the way through the tunnel the pipe was in contact with the dry rocks but my foot resting on the pipe was covered with a water-soaked shoe the records of the agricultural department indicate that lightning strikes far more frequently through the east than through the west illinois and florida being most frequently struck yet in these states death and damage from lightning are almost negligible it is extremely rare for a big wild animal to be struck by lightning yet the woods and the mountains are peopled with moose deer elk bear and mountain sheep birds and squirrels however with roosts and nests in the treetops and woodpeckers with homes in tree trunks are occasionally killed once i was out for a few days with a burrow satan who was totally depraved he wanted to leave undone everything he was asked to do in all his dreams a self-starter had not occurred to him once in motion he had but one speed always on low i found myself wondering if lightning had any affinity for burrows satan was supposed to be the burden bearer of the expedition yet under a psychological test or in the field test his usefulness should have been rated low and i personally told him that he was wholly non-essential to this so-called vacation trip and to the happiness of the world as well a vigorous expenditure of energy and expletive did not get us anywhere one day we turned into camp during a downpour of rain we asked satan to move a few yards further that we might unpack under the shelter of a tree but with feet outbraced at every corner two storms at once failed to move him he pretended to go to sleep while we removed our bedding in the rain just as the last of the pack was removed two terrific lightning bolts struck close by these resounding crashes instantly put life and fear into satan when a smashed treetop fell near him he rose on his hind legs and put his arms affectionately around me hitting me over the eye with one shod hoof i tolerated this demonstration simply because except for his firmness 
we would have been in the shelter of the tree which the lightning had hit on the head once i watched two black and broken cloud strata that were piled against the horizon with a misty peak of summit cloud a thousand feet or more up in the sky from this cloud peak there burst out together three golden rivers of lightning these separated ran vertically down the sky several thousand feet and united in the lower cloud stratum a number of times in the mountains i have seen shafts zigzag flashes and sinuous golden lightning burst out of an absolutely clear blue sky and descend to the earth i have also seen trees struck by what appeared to be a golden ball of lightning which rolled into the tree horizontally on one occasion a globe was followed by a number of other golden globes which traveled slowly over the same course once near camp i saw both golden globes and golden rivers of lightning playing liquid fire over high mountains against the clear stars of night these spectacular fireworks were accompanied with rumbling and crashing as though a violent thunderstorm was in progress yet nowhere in the sky or on the horizon was there a cloud in sight the only possible explanation i could make of this exhibition was that beyond and below the high mountain horizon and not many miles off a storm was in progress End of chapter 9chapter ten of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain the best thing in life is sentiment and the best sentiment is that which is born of accurate knowledge nature study is seeing what one looks at and drawing proper conclusions from what one sees happiness is nothing more or less than pleasant and efficient thinking the person who actually knows the pussy willow will know how to become acquainted with the potato bug he will introduce himself liberty hyde bailey chapter ten landmarks landmarks and their surrounding scenes form pictures which every frontiersman or outdoor person learns to keep in mind the explorer and the scout frequently look back also to the right and the left sometimes the trail may be retraced the landmark may be seen from the opposite direction or the trail may be crossed for the outdoor person to know where he is to know what lake cliff meadow or spring is to the north south east and west of him is the most important part of all woodcraft this information prevents one becoming lost it enables the prospector to return to the place where the rock outcrop carrying gold was discovered it is both interesting and necessary for one who enjoys the outdoors to be able to return to the lightning struck tree the almost hidden beaver colony the nest of the hummingbird and to recall the peculiarities of a particular place and its distance from the orchid or the bear sign which he saw like a poet he must be able to give to each special thing a local habitation and individual character but looking back along the blazed trail of memory are numerous adventures and incidents that remain a part of my mental possessions and stand out as landmarks in my life i had done much camping without experiencing any serious difficulty in starting my campfire even during the worst of weather but one winter when i was exploring the medicine bow mountains alone as usual i had a fire building adventure which makes me shudder when i recall it on my way across a high pass i was caught on a steep smooth icy slope in a high wind it was too cold to stop and descent had to be made with utmost caution and freezing slowness 
though the wall-like sixty-degree slope was constantly hugged closely the wind a number of times saw how nearly possible it was to wipe me off without doing so the mercury in my pocket thermometer barely showed above the zero mark and all warming performances hurrying arm swinging and dancing were impossible on the icy wind-swept steep i was chilled and benumbed almost beyond movement when the slope commenced to flatten out among the dwarfed and hardy spruces on the uppermost limits of tree growth a quarter of a mile down in the woods was a doorless and deserted cabin in which i hoped to spend the night but with stiffened muscles almost paralyzed with cold it required long and persistent effort to reach the place so chilled was i that my benumbed condition did not shake off even after much kicking and arm swinging in the cabin some of my muscles when moved had a feeling akin to that of my foot is asleep after special attention to my right hand it revived sufficiently to clasp the hatchet handle but half an hour must have elapsed after my arrival at the cabin before a few small chunks were hacked from a fallen tree with these and pitch splinters from my pocket i attempted to start a fire in the old fireplace of the cabin one end of each pitch splinter was hammered into a brush-like condition but my benumbed fingers would not hold a match a number of matches were poured on the floor and a frosted thumb and finger tried in vain to clutch one lying on the floor and trying with both hands also was a failure in desperation i tried to pick up a match between my chattering teeth after mashing my cold stiffened lips i got the match into a position at one side of my mouth the match was lighted by scratching it across a stone with a turn of my head with lips scorching i rolled over and brought the blazing match in contact with the pitch splinters these instantly and eagerly blazed up i made special effort after this nip and tuck experience to learn the best ways of fire starting when both weather and fuel conditions were unfavorable or when wit and muscle were dull or clumsy from cold or exhaustion during long winter snowshoe trips it was my custom to have three separate stocks of matches a leather box a metal box and a package of matches wrapped in oiled waterproof silk which was sewed into my shirt pocket the metal box was usually carried in a trousers pocket and the leather one which would resist water for hours in a coat pocket generally the matches were the black-tipped sulphur ones men have become so chilled and helpless that they have perished after reaching shelter because unable to hold a match with which to start a fire if the fingers are too cold to clutch and strike a match this may be accomplished by catching the match up in the hand along with a stick an inch or less in diameter or with the hatchet handle the match may also be held and struck by binding it to a stick as though to a splint with a turn of a handkerchief or with two or three turns of bark or a string or it may be bound to a finger or a thumb with fingers of both hands helpless the match may be held by getting it between two flat sticks which may be held between both hands starting a fire in a pinch is what wins fate was kind enough to cast me early in life where i formed the acquaintances of the wild folk bears beavers birds chipmunks and coyotes came strangely into my youthful life from the time i realized that animals and birds play merrily and frequently wild life and wild places appealed to me with intensified interest 
my estimate of wild folk rose mightily and the watching of wild life at play has claimed a large share of my outings and has given me an interest that never grows old the otter builds a slide on which to play the whale often plays the solemn grizzly bear plays merrily alone birds dance and play play appears to be a common and enlivening and beneficial habit in the entire world of wild life chipmunks were the easiest animals to tame usually inside of an hour after one appeared i was able to get near him and often to feed him from my fingers a number of friendly chipmunks were taking peanuts from my hands as i sat one day in the doorway of my cabin occasionally one climbed upon my head suddenly around the corner of the cabin came another chipmunk pursued by a weasel the weasel stopped with a show of anger at my presence the frightened chipmunk fell exhausted in front of us when this stranger commenced to revive he showed astonishment at the intimacy of the other chipmunks and myself evidently his parents had taught him that there was no safety first for chipmunks but to flee from man and weasels he looked at me nervously for a few seconds i talked to him but he still appeared frightened then i took a step toward him he turned to run but evidently remembered the weasel and stood up to look and listen as there were no signs of his pursuer he turned for another look at the chipmunks and me at this instant a friendly beggar faced up and took a peanut from my fingers the stranger could not believe his eyes he rose on tiptoe to watch us he came slowly six steps toward us then at once retreated four but as nothing happened he presently joined the playing chipmunks one scolded and another literally kicked him over but he hung near i threw him a peanut he grabbed it scampered to a nearby log and standing erect ate it then he came close for another the following day he took a nut from my hand the chipmunks spent seven months of each year underground the other five months they hustled about digging new tunnels for winter quarters gathering winter food sometimes scolding the magpies and once in a while playing with the rabbits they spent hours at a time making these tunnel homes piling the earth out on the grass oftentimes they left their work and came hurrying to see me with their faces very dirty a chunk of dry earth frequently stood up on the end of a chipmunk's nose they enjoyed a dust bath now and then a chipmunk dusted himself so thoroughly that he appeared more like a gray ground squirrel than a chipmunk with black and brown stripes while still a boy i built a log cabin in the rocky mountains of colorado and made my home there for a number of years there was only one other cabin within miles few people came to see me birds and animals were my callers visitors and neighbors the region was ideal for a wide range of wildlife there were scattered pines and aspen around my cabin which stood in an open valley on the mountain slope above grew a dense spruce forest below a lively brook rushed through a willow dotted meadow i often saw deer that came to the brook to drink and i spent many hours watching the activities of the beavers that established a colony on the stream nearly all the birds and smaller animals were friendly toward me from the start they were just as eager to know me as i was to know them i was interested in every living thing i welcomed the wild people large and small and all quickly learned that i was not dangerous and that nothing around my cabin was ever killed in a little while bluebirds wrens chickadees camp birds crested jays robins rabbits squirrels and chipmunks not only trusted me but oftentimes rushed to me for safety when frightened and when threatened by their enemies 
they showed their interest in this place of safety and my cabin became the center of a little wildlife reservation two bluebirds built beneath the end of the ridge pole over the door before the cabin was completed they were confiding from the start but not until the first eggs were hatched did they take the time to call upon me one afternoon mrs blue flew in and circled the room and as she went out her mate came in the next time both came in together and curiously examined a number of objects on the table after this they often alighted upon my shoulders and ate from my hands a wren often sang outside while i stood within reach and sometimes too came into the cabin for something to eat but he never alighted upon me nor ate from my fingers except in summer flocks of chickadees came every few days the first flock that i welcomed looked at me and called sweetly to one another i stood close and talked to them offering something to eat but they went on busily feeding from limb to limb they were sometimes scattered over and through two nearby trees at once but one day a flock stopped for a merry visit two three four the entire flock alighted on me all merrily calling chickadee dee dee momentarily chickadees took possession of me head arms and shoulders then they flew forward one or more at a time constantly calling to one another so that none would be left behind these cheerful little people always seemed happy in their food hunting rambles within a minute after the first camp birds called they were eating from my hand they are a confiding bird wherever found while they were with me they were most gentle chatting in low tones and moving about deliberately but they never remained more than a few minutes they lived among dense evergreen forests and do not seem to like the open but they made me occasional visits the year round the haughtiest lordliest and wisest bird visitor was the long-crested jay with dark blue coat and with top of head and crest jay black they were ever reserved and though trusting me never became confiding they came every day during the winter months but in summer went away to canada and alaska every living thing responded in its own way sometimes a bird came close and by looks and action appeared to be trying to speak it required a long time and even special efforts with a few species of birds and animals before they understood that it was safe to be near me but once they lost fear they became curiously watchfully interested in every move i made the shy nervous rabbits at last made up their minds that i was not ferocious then they would come to feed in the yard during the daytime i discovered they were out more often during cloudy days than during sunny ones on a bright day they always sat or fed around the edge of a tree shadow never putting a nose or an ear out in the sunshine unless hopping to another place of safety evidently shadows were camouflage against hawks or other enemies in shadow was safety first the rabbits were with me the year round while my pony was eating rock salt in the meadow one autumn day a wild mountain sheep a bighorn came up and joined her the sheep saw me approaching and ran off while i was still a quarter of a mile away a few days later he came again for salt i had moved the block of salt nearer the cabin the sheep circled it a few times and retreated but came back that afternoon the next time he came i stood within a stone's throw of the salt he came almost to it then turned and ran away at high speed a month later he returned and found the salt in the same place i stood within a stone's throw carrying himself erect and alert he advanced with frequent stops to the salt 
and licked it for a minute or longer the following summer he finally came to the salt when i sat near it thus on the installment plan we became acquainted or rather salt and safety brought us together one afternoon he stood boldly looking at me over a distance of thirty feet i embarrassed him by asking how is the weather on the heights he jerked his head up and down i asked which crag did you last climb then he lost his fear and was curious one day after seven years of friendly advances he came boldly to my cabin and licked salt from my hand the home of the bighorn is among the mountain tops this one lived on a plateau that was twelve thousand feet above sea level here he spent the winter as well as the summer but now and then he made an excursion into the lowlands i noticed that he came down for the earliest green grass near my cabin which was at least three weeks earlier in appearing than the green grass on the plateau up in the sky sometimes he came for salt generally he came down for some definite thing but now and then the sheep left the heights with no particular purpose occasionally i saw where a bear had been ambling along the brook and more often i saw where one had been in a ravine only a minute's walk from my cabin bears are big shy people but they quickly learn of places where they are welcome they are not savage or ferocious but harmless full of fun fellows unless shot at or chased with dogs and prefer playing to fighting early mornings i often went out hoping to find one one morning while climbing a mountainside near my cabin i heard the breaking and tearing of rotten logs behind a tree clump and slipped around to get a glimpse of whatever it was through the spruce woods it was a big brown grizzly bear just the tips of his fur were silvery he was seated dog-like by a large half-rotten stump eating ants and grubs every few seconds he reached out with right forepaw and ripped loose a chunk of the stump and then licked it with his tongue three or four times he dug into the torn stump with his right paw and picked up something which he put in his mouth he was an interesting sight somewhat like a great puppy his eating with one paw and being right-handed most impressed me in the midst of his eating he scented me stood on his hind legs looked calmly in my direction for three or four seconds and then lumbered off through the woods stopping only once to look back after a short while i followed his trail where he had crossed the brook he left a track in the mud that looked very much like the track of a barefooted man one day i saw him in a wild raspberry patch biting off the tops of the vines and eating vines thorns leaves and berries that afternoon i saw him catching mice in the edge of a grassy place close to a beaver pond most bears live upon berries roots grass grasshoppers mice and other small animals consuming so many pests and dead animals their food habits make them useful to man rarely does a bear kill a big animal wild or tame they never eat human flesh i raised two lively grizzlies these were caught in the nearby woods when tiny cubs each about the size of a rabbit they were playful and friendly they had merry times boxing wrestling digging and tumbling about in the water johnny and jenny were never cross and were the most wide awake youngsters that i have ever seen bears always interested me the grizzly is considered the greatest wild animal in the world he has strength speed endurance and impressive size he attends to his own affairs but he is curious concerning everything strange that he sees readily adjusts himself to new conditions and is never stupid 
bears are threatened with extermination and need protection the wilderness is one of the safest and most interesting places on earth early in my life i had a camping trip with the great john muir in the mountains of california he told me that he had tramped the mountains of the west alone and without a gun and nothing had ever attacked him such has been my experience the camera adds purpose and interest to an outing it is educational and develops the artistic and the habit of seeing the beautiful of looking for the best a cloud-piercing peak wild mountain sheep beaver colonies a waterfall touched with light and shadow and many other pictures are ever in waiting these will preserve with startling delightful fidelity the interesting experiences of the trip recently the region in which i enjoyed wilderness folk when a boy became a wildlife reservation through the making of the rocky mountain national park with the increased numbers of wildlife reservations and national parks in which animals are never shot at the boys and girls of the country will have an opportunity to become better acquainted with all the wild animals large and small to watch easily bears and beavers birds and butterflies these national parks are also wild flower reservations in them the geological wonders the forests the wild bloom the folk in fur and feathers are protected for their higher values for uses in education for enjoyment for giving relaxation and universal sympathy for inspiring vision and for enriching the imagination these wilderness places are happy hunting grounds for all and in them the nature guide has supreme opportunities for useful and ennobling service End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of The Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Every child should have mud pies, grasshoppers, water bugs, tadpoles, frogs, mud turtles, elderberries, wild strawberries acorns chestnuts trees to climb brooks to wade in water lilies woodchucks bats bees butterflies various animals to pet hayfields pine cones rocks to roll sand snakes huckleberries and hornets and any child who has been deprived of these has been deprived of the best part of his education luther burbank we read and studied out of doors preferring the sunlit woods to the house all my early lessons have in them the breath of the woods the fine resinous odor of pine needles blended with the perfume of wild grapes seated in the gracious shade of a wild tulip tree i learned to think that everything has a lesson and a suggestion indeed everything that could hum or buzz or sing or bloom had a part in my education noisy throated frogs katydids and crickets held in my hand until forgetting their embarrassment they thrilled their reedy note little downy chickens and wild flowers the dogwood blossoms meadow violets and the budding fruit trees i felt the bursting cotton bowls and fingered their soft fiber and fuzzy seeds I felt the low soughing of the wind through the cornstalks, the silky rustling of the long leaves, and the indignant snort of my pony as we caught him in the pasture and put the bit in his mouth. Ah, me, how well I remember the spicy, cloverly smell of his breath. Helen Keller Chapter 11 Children of My Trail School One summer day, nearly twenty years ago, a number of boys and girls appeared at my rocky mountain cabin they wanted me to go with them to the old beaver colony a boy and a girl started making the request but before they could finish every child was asking me to go 
it is more than two miles i told them and we must walk this but added to their desire to go at once stepping softly and without saying a word we slipped through the woods and peeped from behind the last trees into a grassy opening by the beaver pond hoping for a glimpse of a coyote or a deer then we examined the stumps of aspens recently cut by the beavers we walked across the dam we made a little raft of logs and went out to the island house in the pond then we built tiny beaver houses and also dugouts in the bank we played we were beavers on the way home we turned aside from the trail to investigate a delightful bit of forested wilderness between two brooks we were explorers in a new country the grove was dense and full of underbrush it was voted to send out a likely boy and girl to discover how many miles it was through the forest while waiting we decided to examine one of the brooks which someone called the amazon river we found a delta which one boy insisted was the delta at the mouth of the mississippi no one objected and we had discussions concerning deltas large and small but the vast wilderness between our two brooks which contained really but one acre was reported by our two scouts as altogether too large for us ever to explore someone then proposed we should cross the brook on a fallen log to see who the strange people were in the wilderness on the other side the last boy of the party made a long jump from the end of the log and declared he had jumped across a nation that one boundary line was the end of the log and the other was where he alighted just where the remaining two lines should be provoked a profound discussion as boundary lines of nations often do it was finally agreed that the other lines should be determined by one of the girls taking a hop skip and jump we decided to take a census and at once everyone began to count the inhabitants of this nation we found a number of bugs spiders and beetles then other beetles and a few grasshoppers and finally everyone surrounded a swarming ant hill trying to determine how to make an accurate count of this warlike and numerous tribe this was never settled for suddenly a big grasshopper with black and yellow wings entered the nation from the outside he alighted for only a moment and then flew away again the opinion was about equally divided as whether he should be counted as one of the inhabitants or an invader at this stage someone broke the news that it was already too late for us to reach home for lunch so intense had been the interest that we had forgotten even to keep track of mealtime two likely boys were sent to forage for rations with suggestions that they go to the kitchen and procure supplies enough to prevent starvation among the explorers until night and return by the shortest route while we were eating merrily around a campfire by the brook a wasp and a fly engaged in a struggle on the mountainside the top of the mountain was no higher than the knee of the boy who stood by it when this life and death struggle ended by the contestants falling over a precipice thousands of feet below everyone concluded it was time to go home that evening these excited and enthusiastic boys and girls related the day's experience to anyone who would listen they had been explorers in a wilderness they had camped by mighty rivers had seen wild animals and strange nations their imaginations were on fire this world had become an inexhaustible wonderland these children were dealing with real things through interest and their imaginations blazed with more keenness than it was possible for the powers of legends and fairy tales to incite they had been to school had studied had worked had learned without realizing it their reports amounted to enthusiastic recitations of new big lessons well learned 
best of all they were happy and were eager to go on with this schooling this developing we have continued these excursions somewhat irregularly through the years to the present time and handled them with increasing effectiveness while a guide on long's peak i developed what may be called the poetic interpretation of the facts of nature scientific names in a dead language together with classifications that dulled interest were ever received as they should have been with indifference and lack of enthusiasm by those who did not know hence i began to state information about most things in the form of its manners and customs its neighbors and its biography nature's story-book is everywhere and always open and i wish children might have everywhere what the children have had here in enjoyment educational foundation and incentive what we are doing here may be done elsewhere john muir in writing of his boyhood experiences says the animals about us were a never-ending source of wonder and delight how utterly happy it made us nature streaming into us wooingly teaching her wonderful glowing lessons so unlike the dismal grim ashes and cinders so long thrashed into us here without knowing it we were still in school every wild lesson a love lesson not whipped but charmed into us interest gives the ability and energy to see accurately and the incentive to watch for things that may happen around us added purpose to every outdoor day such happy experiences based on interest truly enrich life agassiz says that his chief claim to distinction was that he had taught men to observe interest is the master teacher the robinson crusoe school was the name someone early applied to us but later the name trail school was taken this school the great outdoors is in session whenever children wander over the trail free from academic chaperonage the trail supplies materials and equipment and mother nature is an endless mental stimulus we are in a high mountain valley in one corner of the rocky mountain national park at an altitude of nine thousand feet the locality is rich in natural history within three miles of us there are hundreds of varieties of flowers dozens of kinds of birds a number of wild animals including beavers and bears forests of pine fir spruce and aspen steep mountains lively streams and a number of kinds of rocks the trail school is little more than a name plus results there is no organization no staff no opening no closing it has no courses of study no set times for study no set tasks no grade cards the children follow any interest that appeals and when it appeals they are never asked to pursue anything distasteful in fact any given subject or for any given period there are no recitations and no examinations competition as ordinarily known does not exist there are no prizes for excellence no honors for achievement each child is too busy acquiring additional facts to concern himself about having more or less than his companions he is not studying for a preparatory school or for college we strive to see to it that these children continually use their faculties honoring facts rather than authority books we highly prize but their price is made wholly secondary and incidental information given the children is tied up with life connected with neighbors and given a place or a part in things going on the following will show our usual ways of answering a question walking along the summit of a rocky ridge we rounded a cliff 
and came upon an aged and picturesque tree one child asked what all wanted to know the name what kind of tree it was we speculated concerning the life of this old tree wondered concerning storms that had struck it we noticed that its arms were long so long that the tree was wider than high we measured its height and its diameter noted the color and character of its bark one last year's cone on the ground looked as though varnished the unripe ones on the tree were grass green then we examined the needles they were fastened on the branches in little bundles of five at last we concluded that it must be a limber pine i remember reading about it in john muir's the mountains of california said one child he often found it growing on dry rocky wind-swept ridges when a new boy or girl arrives he or she is generally full of movie talk or train experience or eager to find out concerning riding fishing or other long treasured plans but these outing children talk presto change the new arrival edges toward mother and begs to join the young explorers the next day we ask the children not to discuss either personalities or the movies one evening a number of boys were about to leave with sleeping bags to camp for the night in a beaver colony when a new boy fresh from the city and the movies came along he joined them he talked incessantly concerning the movies as soon as sleeping bags were piled and before wood was gathered for a campfire two of the boys led the movie one off behind a clump of fir trees and demanded from him whether he would stop movie talk or if he would make it necessary for them to beat him up it squelched him nevertheless during this trip he picked up a new interest we have yet to find a lazy child minds and muscles move willingly again and again we have been assured that this or that child could not or would not learn but under trail school environment he formed new habits under the zest and spell of interest he joyfully and tellingly applied himself these children are one hundred percent concentrated they have the burning morale of interested youth they are doing things they want to do still other things they want to learn many of their activities would be classed as work except by themselves to help complete a flower exhibition two girls and two boys voluntarily climbed nearly twenty five hundred feet up the mountain when they had gathered the desired plants they made a side trip for another rare flower two of these children were considered dull and lazy yet how energetic and concentrated they were an excellent illustration of how interest and development create and administer discipline the mountain trail is a part of the earth's most influential environment it is an avenue of interest it mingles life motive opportunity and desire whoever travels the trail is enjoying living and learning is going somewhere in trail environment mother nature mingles facts and fun and the traveler readjusts himself to its conditions and develops along the way with a party of more than twenty we one day cooked our lunch over a campfire we used little sticks for the fire and kept it as small as possible as indians were supposed to be after us we burned every scrap of refuse and carefully covered the ashes with a flat rock being clean is the most concealing camouflage for a camp when we left it the place did not look as though anyone had ever camped there although we had twenty in this party we generally limited the number to five or six trailing appears to be the supreme outdoor experience sometimes we follow the track of a deer or a horse at other times one of the party travels for ten minutes from a given point and is allowed to conceal his trail in every way he can think of 
at the word we set off eagerly to follow this concealed trail there is concentration enthusiasm and application in following a trail of any kind the girls frequently excel the boys one of our excursions was an exciting two-day search for the source of a stream we found it above the limits of tree growth in a little pool at the foot of a cliff there were mountain sheep tracks by it on the tiny stream each boy and girl launched a boat the tiny leaf of an alpine plant which was to report promptly with its message to some boy or girl in new orleans we tried out our noses polemonium with blossoms of peculiar and pungent odor is called skunkweed the children were blindfolded and asked to find an interesting flower blooming about twenty-five feet from them which was sending wireless signals for the nose merry times they had seeking for it in all succeeding trips that we made there was increased and enjoyable use of the sense of smell we tasted and smelled of the bark and needles of the balsam fir tree as an important preliminary to searching for it that night with our noses any one who desired was allowed to supplement taste and touch also a little girl who was the first to find it was not certain until she had touched the tree to which her nose led her one windy day we were exploring a dense primeval forest when the sound of a cascading brook reached our ears we stopped to listen and to separate the flowing tones of the water from similar sounds the wind made in the pines then we tried to determine the direction to the brook and also the distance by the sounds of the water in a comparatively open level place we walked round and noted the boulders and the trees one at a time was then blindfolded and asked to find a particular tree or boulder one of the incidents i sometimes tell to heighten the interest when we are training our senses is of several blind men in wheeling west virginia who walked more than a mile one winter night to hear me lecture another is of a blind indian in british columbia who took me several miles up and then down a swift mountain stream guided by touch sound and his imagination many a time the children and i drew maps and pictures with sticks in the sand sometimes we set down a part of the multiplication table on a big sand map we located beaver colonies big trees little trees places where we had camped places where we had seen mountain sheep places we had explored one of the places the children best remembered was the top of the twin peaks where we had lain down and with magnifying glasses carefully looked at the tiny dwarf flowers another was that strange timberline of dwarfed and twisted trees on the side of long's peak still another was chasm lake an utterly wild place where there were ice piles snowdrifts flowers and lichened rocks and where a big fat woodchuck had come out to eat scraps of lunch from our fingers on the sand map we also marked places unexplored spots where we hoped soon to go and to make discoveries we try to develop in the child mind the spirit of exploration so he may enjoy the search for facts both in books and in the outdoors before long he eagerly hunts through books or appeals to individuals to satisfy some interest roused on the trail the results have been immeasurable and inspiring with eye and ear and nose the children gather rare materials materials that arouse reflection imagination reasoning the brain is growing a nature library is kept convenient for the children and they use it with inspiring enthusiasm in this library are the best works obtainable on natural history books concerning birds bears beavers insects wild flowers and forests written by people with an intimate acquaintance with and an enthusiasm for their subjects these are books filled with facts 
there is not a single reference to fairies who rewarded good children bears that ate bad children are not even mentioned there are no billboards carrying morals in capital letters there are no lessons either brutally blunt or with camouflage decorations there are no textbooks someone once called my attention to the fact that my nature library lacked the common books that were written about nature for children these had not been intentionally omitted i had never thought of them nor through the years had a single child ever asked for one of them so i believe for most practical purposes they may be classed as non-essentials one day while homeward bound after two hours with the strange trees at timberline we purposely came close to a large and nearly round boulder all ran to examine it we called it the ice king's marble ice probably had taken it from the top of long's peak and carried it across a canyon while the interest was on this boulder the whole glacial story was opened from that hour these children had an eye for glacial topography and a mind for books concerning glaciers the children often wrote a delightful account of an experience or of their special interest such accounts were not booky they were spontaneous these compositions were what we desired but they were not required nor even lightly requested generally in the study of zoology or botany the student begins with the far away primitive and least interesting forms of life and memorizes we use the bird animal or flower at hand we learn something of its life history of its evolution of its relation to surrounding plants and animals of its enemies its travels its food and sometimes how it has been changed by environment we learn something of the year-round life of mountain sheep of beavers and other animals and of birds their popular names we use as a label or mark of identification but we learn all we can before becoming serious concerning the name in due time and this is by the time scientific names and classifications mean something the children find both interesting our method has been efficient whether the prescribed one or not by it the boys and girls have laid the foundation for an education and learned many of the facts and principles of nature and what is important they have learned that the outdoors is friendly most people think that the wilderness is a supremely dangerous place for human beings they carry through life a handicap of fear of the outdoors these children learn that the wilds are not only friendly but hospitable they find ferocious animals only in storybooks and ere long being out of dark or in the rain is fun a well-known educator recently emphasized the fact that to have a sane and healthful view of life it is necessary to have correct fundamental information concerning natural history and that this knowledge can be acquired only by intimate contact with nature for two or three hours in a primeval forest we played that we were primitive people the children had a glimpse of the childhood of our race learned something of the diet of primitive people why we have so many domesticated plants all this started overseeing mushrooms and wondering whether they were poisonous when out with nature the unexpected often happens if we come upon something well worth while like a mother bird leading her young from the nest beavers at play or a near view of mountain sheep we remain and make the most of this opportunity each new interest is opportunity the interest is sometimes heightened by the children abruptly determining what is next to be seen in the course of a month we use telescope microscope botanies bird and animal books and frequently call in the use of multiplication and percentage the children have many irons in the fire only one is hot at a time but how it is then hammered 
anyone who goes with the children is considered by them a welcome outsider or a privileged guest honored and consulted but ever under their orders however that they should not come to depend on an older person accompanying them i sometimes leave them as we start homeward sometimes they vote to return home under the orders of one of the children as leader but several often go off together or by twos or even one alone each child is encouraged to report anything of unusual interest if a discovery is made a crippled animal or a rare flower he is to return at once and tell others about it sometimes scouts are sent out to look for young beavers bear signs or to see whether the first blue fringed gentians have bloomed there is a bulletin board in the nature room on which appear notices of future excursions of discoveries of special meetings of exhibitions of flowers rocks and other things wanted for these exhibitions and recent outdoor photographs when the children are not in the field a conference may be called at any time it was a stay-at-home day the morning a boy came rushing in to report that a side of a canyon had fallen in children hurried right and left to tell others and in a few minutes all were off to see the landslide they forgot to take lunch along eagerly they discussed the probable cause of this slide and also the results from it it dammed the gulch and was already forming a pond how long we wondered before water-loving plants and animals would come to live here this gave an excellent opportunity to discuss the supreme productive resource soil other resources had their innings water forests birds and so too did erosion topography and streams i had to tell of landslides i had seen and where the best accounts of big landslides might be read we were returning from a day's outing when we came upon an unextinguished campfire here is a mighty forest fire i said how many will volunteer to fight it to a finish instantly everyone volunteered a boy was sent for help a girl was sent for a pail of water we fought and won that night we read up on firefighting we often walked home through the rain during several downpours we deliberately went out into the storm on a few gray days we climbed up the mountainside through a solid sky of clouds until we were above them in the sunshine we also made little journeys after dark visiting pine woods beaver colonies and streams calling on hundreds of sleepy flowers watching shadowy coyotes and owls and listening to their playful cries and calls the unfortunate attitude of the parent was an obstacle to every outing many were thrown into a panic when a trip for their children was proposed and too often came out of the panic to condemn such excursions with all the vehemence of old error each new parent on the scene exhibited a misunderstanding of the outdoors we never had a serious accident never were attacked by bears or any other wild animal and never did a child even catch cold these facts together with the enthusiasm of the children for such outings and their obvious development won out we discouraged the collecting of specimens but we encouraged the bringing in of a mental record an account of the day's experience from now on we shall provide a book and encourage each child to write down the most important experience of the day as part of the outing round i should have done this long ago i have lost many happy accounts a few unusual specimens collected by the children have been preserved for their natural history association and their nature room in this room they hold meetings if a child comes upon something deemed rare something that will be of general interest he is encouraged to bring it in for the nature room one afternoon the association unanimously decided to bring in a tree with an unusual history all the children went along 
and its getting filled half a day for them full of thought and action this young pine when twenty-one years of age was knocked down by a fire-killed tree falling upon it the top straightened up and made a loop almost around the dead tree that rested upon and distorted it we learned the young pine's age from the annual growth rings in the stump and also how many years it had lived before being injured and how many since occasionally the children give an exhibition and invite the older people to see it they plan these exhibitions and gather and arrange materials for them while a rock exhibition was on we discussed geology rock formations and transformations volcanoes earthquakes erosion rock strata and color during a flower exhibition we discussed the evolution of plants pollination interdependence with insects and seed distribution often i am too busy or there are too many boys and girls or it seems best to have someone else accompany a party afield but to find individuals who will do this without becoming teachy or preachy and deadly to the children is most difficult most teachers some parents and many others want us to ignore interest and desire and force the children to memorize something which they consider worthwhile one day a well-known school superintendent offered to help us he unfolded his plans in the presence of a number of children i wish you could have seen the effect of his words upon them when he proposed classes and study system and grading and examinations each child heard the suggestions just as he would hear the threat of a probable whipping the academic mind and in many respects the old puritanical mind holds that things pleasurable and interesting are to be shunned that they are akin to vice that it is virtuous to do the disagreeable things and all important to force yourself to do what you do not like but in human psychology it is ever important to get results while working under morale using all the power that interest adds thus finally you can accomplish the most difficult and greatest results through the supreme sustained efforts that desire and interest make possible natural phenomena interest and stimulate the mind in a thousand ways we had a variety of kinds of excellent discipline i sometimes think that discipline as it is applied in the school world actually dwarfs the senses and robs life of its interest mathematics dead language when not liked drudgery and disagreeable tasks usually dull those upon whom they are inflicted and develop half-hearted habits the psychology of youth calls for discipline of a different character this is pleasurable discipline these children frequently and cheerfully labor under severe self-imposed discipline and under this all their faculties are at their best fortunate is the child whose discipline is determined by its own inspiration interest makes play of the hardest work we sat for more than two hours upon a log by a beaver pond when we had at last satisfied ourselves that muskrats the little brothers of the beaver were living in an abandoned beaver house we started on and then questions and comments came thick and fast sometimes we would count all the flowers that grew in a circle the diameter of which corresponded to the height of the shortest child in the party sometimes we counted all the trees in a given square every normal child is as avaricious for information as a miser is for gold this childish desire to know to learn will assure mental development if information be given in a way that appeals children can learn but little from cold unrelated segregated facts from academic system and memorized rules hence before the young are assigned to learn the definite cut and dried facts their elders deem essential 
they need the development that roused interest gives we try to use to the utmost the interest of the child interest a child and he thinks while a child is thinking he is learning one interest invariably leads to a larger and then to other interests of an evening i listen willingly to their ideas and comments and to their experiences i endeavor to make comments that will cause the child to desire to go back and look again at the wonder things he has seen and at others which he apparently missed i do all i can to stimulate his creative faculty i ever try to answer his questions in a way that will add to his interest and if possible multiply or extend this interest if a child's lesser questions are answered he will presently come back with greater ones surely the opportunity of one's life is to listen helpfully when the child is talking and to answer happily his eager questions the experiences these children have and their reflections concerning the things seen give them the ability to reason and develop their observation and imagination with these powers working there is nothing that can obstruct a child's way to an education he wants to learn and will find a way sometimes in telling their experiences the children let themselves go and use their imagination freely this is excellent it is a healthy imagination they simply expand extend or create the probable continuation of facts they have seen there is nothing magical nothing illogical no monstrosity just poetical interpretation of facts but when asked for the facts about what they have they give them accurately the color size and the neighboring objects they have really observed the average person does well to see with fifty per cent efficiency i have talked separately with three or four children concerning the same experience and their accounts agreed they must have run above ninety per cent in accurate observation president charles w elliott came out with the following sweeping statement in a recent publication by the united states bureau of education called certain defects in american education and the remedies for them it is the men who have learned probably out of school to see and hear correctly and to reason cautiously from facts observed who carry on the great industries of the country and make possible great transportation systems and international commerce dr elliot goes on to say quote, since the united states went to war with germany there has been an extraordinary exhibition of the incapacity of the american people as a whole to judge evidence to determine facts and even to discriminate between facts and fancies this incapacity appears in the public press in the prophecies of prominent administrative officials both state and national in the exhortations of the numerous commissions which are undertaking to guide american business and philanthropy and in the almost universal acceptance by the people at large day by day of statements which have no foundation and of arguments the premises of which are not facts or events but only hopes or guesses again quoting in most american schools there has been a lack of systematic training of the senses to record remember and describe accurately observations made by his own senses little systematic training has been given day by day in the process of determining facts and weighing evidence worst of all most american schools have neglected to enlist and cultivate assiduously the interest of each pupil in his daily work in spite of the obvious fact that no human being child adolescent or adult can do his best work unless he is taking an interest in that work again quoting remedies are the substitution of teaching by observation and experiment for much of the book work now almost exclusively relied on the cultivation in the pupils of activity of body and mind 
during all school time an activity which finds delight in the exercise of the senses and of the powers of expression in speech and writing the insistence on the acquisition of personal skill of some sort the stimulation in every pupil of interest in his work by making the object of it intelligible to him End quote. The trail school methods appear to have developed the constant habit of accurate observation, of learning to see, looking with eager, interested eyes, and seeing things as they are, of an evening when the children are merrily recounting the experiences of the day, we are impressed with the fact that they see accurately, and recount truthfully, and judge by the evidence these children are in love with their activities burroughs has said that knowledge acquired without love will not stick the most amazing things brought out by the trail school are the accuracy with which the children see and acquire facts and the correctness with which they describe what they have seen it might be thought that our ways of doing things would make the children unsystematic but when reached by that magnificent incentive called interest the child goes after anything difficult easy pleasant or otherwise it is a joy to do it we found that the children quickly develop the mental habit of being systematic just through interest it was not long before a child systematically and persistently followed an interest by specializing upon it thus forming the acquaintance also of the things related to it a few weeks of this meant one hundred per cent health the child learned to use his senses learned to see and to hear he accumulated facts materials which compelled thought and developed the imagination he became a reasoner the mind grew like a wild garden when it was all over most of the children had developed interests in world subjects that had not been even mentioned they had sympathies universal feelings they were developing democratic actions and habits above all we try to develop the imagination which has been called quote, the supreme intellectual faculty an imagination based on realities this kind of imagination deals ever with cause and effect it touches cold facts with fancy gives the poetic interpretation that is to say with cause effect and vision it shows possibilities of development a tree seed touched with imagination becomes a forest full of wilderness life in a natural manner without enchantment or magic a prospector dreams of gold and glory he seeks it with a pick never does he look for it at the foot of a rainbow or expect it as a reward from a king or wait for a fairy to bring it most legends and fairy stories mislead the mind and betray the imagination such magic ever dreams of castles in spain mental mirages waste many a life the normal imagination hitches its wagon to a star or a mule and the team travels merrily whether it arrives or not this imagination is based on realities it is one that sees the logical and natural results or developments in advance and pictures glorious changes through natural growth or evolution and never by magic or enchantment this normal imagination is a combination of information and inspiration it is creative rouses effort and gets results in brief then all we are trying to do may be stated as follows we found that every child wanted to learn he asked questions our opportunity lay in the rightful answering of questions these answers must appeal to the imagination we tried in our answer to continue and multiply this interest by showing him something new and more than he was expecting often our answer was part of a story but we answered with words stories demonstrations excursions and even books 
he was led into larger interests nature interested him most nothing discouraged him so long as he was interested interest made play out of work we have never found a lazy child these answers gave impressions gave a variety of mental experiences and resources they pleasantly compelled reasoning and creating started the unquenchable imagination in a short time a child was telling of his interests talking about his experiences he was learning he had begun to create and to express he was interested in life dr arnold said that if he could teach his boys but one thing quotes that would be poetry end quote poetry of course sustains and develops that strange but almost all masterly faculty called imagination and it is doubtful that any influence so helps the imagination as the influence of nature upon the child's mind when captain scott was dying in the antarctic ice fields he wrote to mrs scott quote, make our boy interested in natural history if you can Agassiz has said that a year or two of natural history would give the best kind of training for any other sort of mental work. Long ago, Tyndall emphasized the fact that first-hand facts and materials are infinitely more valuable than those brought to us. Burbank has repeatedly said that intimate contact with nature is necessary for children. A trail school may be had anywhere. In any nook where nature reigns, she tells her story to all children brought to her, and they hear her enthusiastically. But a leader or teacher for each school is the rub. Nature will appeal to children and actively interest them, unless blocked by the teacher. A witty woman once said that the way to interest children in good books is simply to expose children to them a chief means of interesting children in nature is to expose them to bring them into contact with outdoor things every child has an inherent interest in the outdoors which with a little tact may be tied up with any other interest desired books a specialty or with any and every phase of life End of chapter 11.